they can come in. We're going to get started. So I, I don't know who's next door, but uh, it's all right. Titus chapter 2, verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we started this little section here. This is a, a, uh, the grace life in a summation, in a summary. Uh, here is the whole of what the Christian life is all about, the past, the present, and the future. The past there for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That's the, the informa- that is what's happened in the past. That's our uh, justification, uh, grace age salvation. It, it happened in the past and so forth. And then we have the uh, teaching us, the grace of God is going to, teach us. So now we have the present situation. We call that sanctification. And then we have looking for that blessed hope and there's the future. And uh, that future uh, salvation there that uh, we'll have when we leave this present evil world and uh, move forward. So last time we we looked at verse 11. Uh, By the way, it starts with the word for. So now we have a change in uh, in a sub, in, in 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 kind of a tone and tenor here, rather we have an explanation of how and why the sound doctrine is going to work. There is a whole uh, scenario here where you have um, the sound doctrine. It's going to produce produce good works. It's going to work in you. Well, how does that happen? How do you take the sound doctrine? How do you take all the information and bring it into life? You know, how, how do you do that? How, how does that work? And verse 12 is what tells us those mechanics and how that works. Notice he's teaching us that denying ungodliness. By the way, we're, we camped last week in verse 11. We're going to camp this week and next week in verse number 12. And then the next week I'm going to be gone for the, for the weekend uh, Lynn and I are going to get away, so the guys will be filling in and so forth. But uh, I, we're, I'm, not, I'm trying not, not to run through these verses, okay, because they're important. And they're important to you and I to understand how this works, how it's designed to work. Um, we give a lot of service of saying, hey, just live as who you are in Christ. Okay, how does that work? How do you do that? And the, the, these verses um, give us that. Notice verse 12 is, a, is an active voice all through this verse. It's teaching us. The grace of God teaches us. It is not us doing anything. Okay? It's the grace of God that's engaging us. If you try to do this in your own energy of your own flesh, you will fail. It will become a work of your flesh. But when you allow the Word of God to work effectually in you that believe, and you allow the doctrine to be what begins to pump, pump it out for you, then things begin to flow, and there's some peace and harmony and uh, some victory in life. Verse 12, the grace of God teaches us. When we talk about teaching and preaching grace and the grace life, some folks think that that means that you can go, that you're going to live an uncaring, an unfruitful, an undisciplined life. They think that. And that is the furthest thing from the truth, honestly, with you. Because when you develop into your inner man the sound doctrine and the things that grace teaches us, You're taught to put off that old man, and you're taught to put on the new man, you see. So if you're obeying the verse, and that's the big word is obey. (laughs) We can read it and study it, put it into our thinking, but now, man, to go obey it and actually do what it says to do. Yesterday in the men's fellowship, we were looking at the different Bibles and... uh, talking about Satan corrupting the Word of God, 
And uh, the, in, in Romans 13, in the, our fa- in the list of the thou shalt not, the new Bibles leave out thou shalt not bear false witness because they bear false witness. So they leave that one out of the list. It, in, the, in the nine of the ten commandments that, that Paul says you and I are to obey. And uh, why do they do that? Well, because they will be guilty if they put it in there. And they leave it in there. And, and it's, a, it's a different Greek text. But the issue is, is when you put stuff into your inner man and you teaching us that denying, you begin to come along and apply the issues of grace. And when there are two aspects when it comes to the issue of applying the issue of grace in your life and taking the application of grace and taking that information and bringing it into the details of your life. So if you come, on, come back over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So we're going to talk about um, the, the issue of sanctification. The grace of God teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should, what, live soberly, righteously in this present world. It's an interesting thing. We'll look next time about the issue of the present world and the ungodliness and, and the worldly lust and stuff. And this morning, I just want you to get the, 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 the picture of the grace of God teaching us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Corinthians were a great model of what it was to be stuck on yourself. If you, if you think about Calvinism and Arminianist, the Corinthians were the Arminianist. Calvinism is very legalistic. They're the book of Galatians, okay? But, Ca- but the Corinthians were stuck on themselves. They're a very affluent neighborhood. They, they live in a very affluent part of the world of, of the day, major seafaring coast city. And when they did that, they looked around. They said, you know, hey, if they found out somebody had something they didn't, they went and got it. They could just do that, Okay. And yet they were, Paul's going to call them babes. They were carnal. But they're also what? Saints. So when you think about sanctification, look at verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are what? Sanctified in Christ. Your sanctification has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you being on a higher level of learning in your Christian life. There's a big thing that goes around right now. It's been over the last several years. Where, well, you're not on the same level that I am, so when you get here, you can come and talk to me. And there's this plateau stuff that if you get down through the information and you get to here and you get to here and you get to here, now we can have a conversation. And that's not sanctification. Your sanctification is not about where you're at in your learning. These guys are babes in Christ, chapter 3. They've come out of Adam, and they're into Christ. So, (laughs) it's your sanctification isn't a description of a higher level of learning, but rather it's a fact that you've been set apart for a purpose. You've been set there for a reason. Look over at verse 30, or down to verse 30. And I'll tell you what, folks, that's critical to remember. When he says the grace of God teaching us, teaching us that denying, the grace of God is doing the teaching. You're not, you, it's not about you. It's about what, what does the grace of God teach. Look at verse 30, 1 Corinthians 1.30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That is positional truth. That is who you are in Christ. He's been made. Our identity is in Jesus Christ, and it's shared by all the believers. Here are the Corinthians. They are chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> sorry. Chapter 3, verse 1, they're babes and they're carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Verse 3, for ye are yet carnal. These guys haven't, 
they know their position in Christ. If you look back, chapter 1 there, in verse number, oh, verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf. That's interesting. Paul, in every other book, Paul, except for the Corinthians and the Galatians, Paul brings up and he thanks them, the people. Here he thanks God on their behalf. Why? Because they're not living up to who they are in Christ. They're not living according to the doctrine. For the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. They, under, they know their position in Christ. They just haven't taken that and brought it into the details of their life yet. They haven't applied it. They haven't taken the, the, the knowledge of who they are in Christ. They haven't taken Romans 6, 7, and 8 and brought it into their experience in the details of life. They just, eh, it's just Paul again. <laughs> it's okay. It's just Rick again. It'll be all right. No, they have brought it in. So the issue of sanctification, come over to chapter 6. When you understand who you are in Christ, it will teach you and its design is to teach you. Now notice what grace will teach you. Chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, look at verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Why aren't you your own? For ye are bought with a price. You see what the grace of God just taught you right there? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And when he bought you, he made you complete, total sufficiency. He gave you a new identity in Christ. He gave you all this positive stuff. <laughs> he set you free from sin, Romans 6. He made you alive unto God. He gave you this new, wonderful identity. So in Titus 2, verse 12, sound doctrine the grace of God teaches us to deny. And again, the sound doctrine is what's going to produce, come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is what's going to produce the good works, is what's going to produce the application of the doctrine. God's grace doesn't teach you to deny so that you, now listen, can be sanctified. You are already sanctified. That's the point. So the first issue in the application of sound doctrine, one is to, to know about it, and that's what we're talking about it, okay? The grace of God doesn't come along and teach you a bunch of stuff so you can be sanctified. No, you are already sanctified. You are already in that set-apart position as a member of the body of Christ. Now, what you need to do is know it, learn about it. And then the second application issue is the issue of I need it. And now, if I need it, what am I going to do with it? I'm going to take it and put it in. I got my old truck, and it needs a new rear end. The, the rear differential is leaking, so I need new seals. So what do I do? Go down to the store, buy new seals. Pull the bolts off, put the new seals on. You got to get the tools. I don't have the tools, so I got to go rent them. Get the tools, pull the, do all that, put it all back together. Is it ready to run? No. I missed something, didn't I? I need to put the gear oil back in. Right? Otherwise, now, then I need to know a whole new one. <laughs> so, what do you got to do? You got to know what you need. You got to know the information, and then you got to realize that you what? You need it. See? 1 Thessalonians 4. Here's some more about what the grace of God teaches us. Verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's how to walk and to please God. 
Verse 2 is fantastic because in verse 2, what happens? He says, I gave you everything you need to know. Look at verse 2. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord. I, everything you need to know, all the instructions God gave to you and I through the Apostle Paul, it's right there. We just have to do what? Get in there and know it. Study it. Learn about it. Folks, look at verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That, here's the, here's the reason why we're doing this. The identity that we have in Jesus Christ, we're to take that and we're to apply it to the details of, uh, of our lives. It's the will of God that you would know how to possess your vessel. You would know how to operate and function and walk. That's what he's talking about. You have to remember, folks, God is a God of process and patience. <laughs> but he's a God of process. And there's a process here. You're complete in him. He takes you, gives you that complete, that new identity, blesses you with all spiritual blessings, sanctifies you, sets you apart in him. He's made to us wisdom and righteousness and redemption and everything that we need we have in him. And he says, okay, know that, and now let's go and, let you, you, and, and put it into the details. So you need to know it. But then you need to know that you need it. You ever talk to a lost person who doesn't know that they're lost? If you haven't, you haven't talked to the right people. Go find some lost people that don't know they're lost and talk to them. Because they don't think they're lost. They don't think anything's wrong. They know nothing about, they don't think anything's up. <laughs> and what begins to happen then is you have to get them what? Lost. You've got to get them down there to the fact that they understand they're a sinner on the way to hell and the lake of fire. The key in the process is you need to know that you need it. That's the key to the process. Come over with me to Romans 5. And the grace of God teaching us that deny. What's he teaching us? Well, we have this wonderful, uh, we have this riches, this wealth in Christ. And we need to bring it into the details of our lives. And you know what? You need it there. And that's what you need. Look at Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith. So there's phase one, our justification. The result of that is we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what happens when you trust Christ? You get what? Peace. Verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. There's our sanctification. Wherein we stand right here, right now. And rejoice in what? Hope of the glory of God, there's our future. So you got all three in these two verses, okay? Past, present, and future. But notice in verse 2, by whom also we have what? Access. By what? By faith. All of this is an operation of faith. It's by faith. Then Access is a great word, okay? It's a great computer word that Paul wrote back before computers were even a thought. You remember, you know what the first computer was? It was an apple, and all it took was one bite, and it collapsed and crashed. <laughs> ah, okay. It's Happy Father's Day, you know. <laughs> a, a teacher asked a, a little boy in her class, how old is your father? And he's six years. He's a little boy. He's in the kindergarten. How old is your father? Six years ago, <laughs> he's just only six years old. So if I have to explain them, I mean, come on now, you know. you got to work on these, you know. Man, 
I've been keeping them back from you because some of you are a little slow on the go, but, you know, <laughs> got to work on that. So access, that's a wonderful word. H have you ever gone to the computer and it asks you for your password and you click on your password, you type it in and it won't let you in? And you go, man, I know I typed that right. So you type it again and it won't let you in? And you go, what in the world is going on? The cap key is on. One little keystroke denies what? Access to, all, to the information that's in there. One little thing can, can keep you from that access. To access all of the information, all of the wealth that we have in Christ. And you know what? Titus 2.12 tells you, deny that thing. That one item that just slows everything down. Are you still you, go, go, go back to 1 Thessalonians 4. It's an interesting thing. Here are the Thessalonians. They, they are a, a quote-unquote model church, if you will, okay? And, and, but yet they have problems. And it's interesting here in verse number 3 that he brings up their issue, that they would abstain from what? fornication. Why would Paul have to mention it unless it was an issue? It's an issue. So he had to take, he's addressing the issue. One little, one little keystroke is impacting their access. You're going to access it by faith, access that ability to take the, inf the identity that we have and that we stand in and bring it into the details of life. Move it from page and principle and thinking into actuality of life. And you do that again by faith. Because faith is the, the only response that grace will ever accept is faith. And the only response that grace ever demands is faith. And you've got to remember that. If you write down Romans 4, verse 16, you can go over there and look, and that's what he says. You have to remember that. By faith, we're going to do what? We're going to access the information. Verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians 4, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. It's interesting that access by faith is defined for you in verse 4 as possessing your vessel. He's talking about your walk. That as you go and live life, in the details that you live life, that you live as who you are in Christ. Okay? Come over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You see, the grace of God, is, God is very interested in how you live your life. And how you live your life, he is honed in on. He is very interested in it. He doesn't just sit back and say, eh, go live any way you want. Not at all. He says, I, I gave you everything you need. I've made you all sufficient, complete. Go live for me. But when you go live for me, here's how I want you to live. 2 Timothy 2, look at verse 21. Here's another thing about like that, that issue of denying. <laughs> if a man therefore purge himself from these. Now the these is the false doctrine in the context above it. The failure to rightly divide the word. Okay? He shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Notice the, the, that verse is straightforward, isn't it? There's no gray area there. There's no, well, maybe, maybe. no, it's straightforward. These are, the, you purge yourself, you deny you look at your life and you say, these things don't belong in my life. They're a waste of my time. They're a waste of my energy. I don't need them. They're just diluting it away, and I'm just going to get rid of them. 
And then when they pop their little head back up, you uh, whack mole them, you mole whack them, and you say, no, I said, get out. And you just purge yourself of that. You do that two or three times, and you know what will happen? They'll quit popping up. Because sin starts in your thinking. Way before you ever do the action, you've thought it down through, James tells us. It's a thinking process. And if, you're, if something keeps popping up, guess what you're doing? You're thinking about it. A guy one time says, well, Rick, I need to talk to you about my problems. I'm like, why? Talk, did talking about your problems fix your problem? No. Then why are we talking about your problem? Well, I need to talk to you. I said, I'll talk to you, but we're going to go to see what God's Word says about that. You know, what does God's Word say? Let's do that. Well, but I got a problem. What does God's Word say? Let's do that. You know, I'll talk to you about your problems, but did talking about your problems fix your problem? You can put the whole psychiatry business out of business. Okay? Again, come over to Titus 2. The issue here, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. To deny, to purge, get the stuff out of your life. It's a waste of my time. You don't have a part of my life. You don't. You're not even going to creep up on the counter like a, like a roach just coming over to you. You're not even. Why? Because Christ did what? He died for that. He, he put away that sin. How did he do it? Hebrews 9 tells us by the sacrifice of himself. Hey, that's what hung my... Last night we went and ate Emily's birthday. We went and ate... And we get in, and there's like 80 of us. No, there's only six of us. So, <laughs> so we tell the wait, the host, six of us. She goes, it'll be about 30 minutes. You're a big party. We have a lot of little, I mean, there's people everywhere. And she says, 30 minutes. I'm like, yeah, all right. Because we got a lot of little parties, so the little people were, you know, the little groups were not put. And I'm like, all right. An hour later, we're still standing there. Well, I go up and, you know, hey, you know, update time. You know, Ricky's been up. Linda's been up. Ricky went again, you know. I go up. And she's like, well, about 10 minutes. She goes, we're waiting on two tables. They've been ready to go for 20 minutes. But they're sitting there talking. And that's fine. That's what we're going to do, you know. Now, blowing up and making a big scene would have got you what? Absolutely nothing. You're still waiting on those two tables. So then why do it? Well, it makes me feel good, doggone it. Anger, wrath, malice, evil speaking. Ephesians 4, he says, put it away. Why? Because Christ died for that. He, you don't have to do that. Well, I need to know that I'm, they know I'm mad. They know you're mad. Look, the last thing that lady wants is for you to come up and ask for an update. You, you know, you don't under, you know, maybe you don't realize that. The last thing that host wants to have to do is to deal with you. They want you to sit down, eat, pay your bill, and leave. What are they in the business of doing? coddling you and making sure your feelings are all wonderfully, oh, poor baby, it's okay. No. They want, what do they want to do? They want to get your wallet, pay the bill, because they got a bottom line. You see, so why blow up? I didn't blow up. I told her, I said, I understand you don't want to see me, but I'd just like to know, you know, what's going on. She goes, oh, you guys are next. So we're sitting there. And you know what? Four tables got up of big parties and filing out. Well, now what do they got to do? They got to clean them, wipe them down, reset. You know, they got to do their thing. You know, another five, ten minutes. Hey, whatever. Okay. Meanwhile, the stomachs are growling. You know, it's like, it's about time to eat. Arr. It's like, well, here, have, <laughs> have, a, ha, have a lifesaver, you know. <laughs> oh, it's Father's Day. My dad, one time, my mom, 
growing up, I mean, we were poor. We, even living in Chicago, uh, my, if you ask my dad if he would have macaroni and cheese, you better duck because <laughs> we just ate it all the time growing up because we have kids and puts feeds and everything. So mom wanted to go to Red Lobster for her birthday or for something special. So dad took her to Red Lobster in the parking lot, drove around and left. Ooh, that didn't go, we were with her. That didn't go over very well at either. So then it was be very more, now you have to understand my dad's sense of humor. I have the same sense of humor, by the way, okay? So then she says, no, I want to go to Red Lobster and eat. So she pulls into the park. He goes, well, you didn't say that. So he made the block, went in, parked, handed her a lifesaver and said, here, eat, eat away. Oh, man, now we did go in and eat, but, you know, it's just the, you know, hey, yeah, and have some fun with it. You see, God is a God of, pract- of, of, of process, but of patience. And you know what we need to learn? Patience. But how do you, see, you see something come up, and what do you do? You say, hey, you don't belong here, because that's what he died for, and no. And you deny it. Access. You deny it. You stop it. You come along and you say, you know what? That's not who I am in Christ. And who I am in Christ, we're going to stop that. Okay? Now, where you learn that, (laughs) again, the grace of God teaches us. The whole issue, folks, is to be able to bring the identity that we have in Christ into every detail of our life and to do it by faith, and to do it consistently. Too often we're on a roller coaster because I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. What were you doing on the wrong side of the bed? You know, know, I got my side, she's got her side. (laughs) If I roll over, she's kicking me, I'm going back. No, well, I just am in a bad mood today. Well, you know what? Too bad. Get over it. You know, got a BA, a bad attitude today. You know, what? well, we can fix that. <laughs> you know, you got to adjust your thinking. You learn that, by the way, in the book of Romans, Romans 6. What do you learn in Romans 6? You learn that you have an identity, don't you? You just learn you got justified in the first five chapters. The last two Sunday mornings, we've been talking about Romans 6. We went through the whole chapter in two weeks. Now, when we do it verse by verse, we won't go through it in two weeks. But the issue is, is what do you learn in Romans 6, verse 1 and 2? Hey, I got a new identity, verse 3 and 4. I'm, I'm identified. He died, his death is my death. His burial is my burial. His resurrection is my resurrection. I learned that I've been set free from the dominion of sin and the control of sin. Sin has been crucified. The old man is crucified. You know why people struggle with sin? They don't believe the verses. They're not walking by faith. Well, yes, I am, Rick. No, you're not. You just got all huffy and puffy with me just right there. I I mean, I did it with me, but... Well, how can you dare you say that? Because that's what the verses say. Well, a better reading would have been... No. What does a verse say? It says you've been set free from sin. You're freed from sin. It's a done deal. Why not go live that way? Why not look, well, I have an issue. We all have issues. Just ask my wife when I drive. Slow down. You're going too fast. She hit me in the back of the head last night. She was sitting behind me. I knew I was in trouble. (laughs) You know, I have witnesses too. You know, husband abuse. You know, presidential abuse, harassment, husband of harassment, you know. <laughs> we all have issues, but what do we do? We just come in and we move them out. You come down in Romans 6 and you find out that you're not under the law because with the law comes the knowledge of sin. You're under grace. You got, you got a choice to make who you're going to Turn, yield yourselves, who are you going to turn yourselves over to? What are you going to do? That's who you're serving, you know. I get on my motorcycle and go down the road. The guys go, why don't you go a little faster? I because I don't, because I like speed, and I know what if I get on speed, if I get going fast, I know what will happen. So I got an old Harley, and it's big, 
heavy, and it was only geared to do about 65, but I've had it at 80, you know. <laughs> and just, it's, eh, why? Because it makes me go slower. Now, I go jump on the demo rides at the bike week and get that big boss hog between your legs. It's a short block V8 on a motorcycle frame. And, ooh, that's fun. Vroom, open that thing up, you know. Boom. You get go a friend of mine had a V-Rod, which is Harley's trying to be a crotch rocket. He goes, you want to take it for a ride? I said, yeah, I do. <laughs> I'll see you next week. <laughs> Vroom, things fast. Get up. You just goose it and you're gone. So what do you do? You know your shortfallings. We just, we don't go that way. You, be, you replace it. You put it off. You purge yourself of it. Does that mean riding a bike, a, heart, a motorcycle is bad? No. You just don't let it control your life. And you take that identity that we've learned from Romans 6. Today we're going to talk about Romans 7. And in a couple weeks we'll talk about Romans 8. You take all of that information and you access it by faith. You deny, Titus 2.12. It's teaching us. By the way, 2 Timothy 3. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. You know the verses. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for what? <laughs> Instruction in righteousness. The grace of God teaches us and it teaches us chapter 2 verse 12 that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world you have the ability to live your life in this present world as who you are in Christ you have that as a privilege it's a privilege to do that. You have that right. And the only thing that stops any of that is when you allow sin to flourish. Whether it's a physical issue or whether it's an attitude sin. If you need those, go read Coloss or Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3. He lays them out for you. Anger, malice, wrath. Evil speaking. You look down there at verse 3, or, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 2, to speak evil of no man. How you doing with that one? Well, our president, he's... Blah, blah, blah. Oh, hold on a minute. You better shut up. That verse says to speak evil of no man. Well, you don't understand. He just, well, you know that goofy congressman, rah, 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 rah. you know that governor here, why didn't he just sign that? Rah, 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 and you just get, Pow. what does verse 3 say? This, or verse 2, to speak evil of no man. What happened? Oh, well, okay, they're working on it. They're, we've been trying to work on the PA system, so we're good. Okay, what, uh, I'm back playing here all week. <laughs> Tip your waitress, okay? <laughs> what happened? To speak evil of no man. Boy, that'll take a lifetime for some of you. Well, you know that group over there, and that group over there. <laughs> really? What about that verse? How about deny that in your life? Ooh, then you got nothing to talk about. Well, then maybe you ought to be reading. <laughs> Let's talk about something that's worthy of reading, of talking about. The only thing, folks, that stops sin in your life is the cross. The cross is what sets you free. And it's where you have the ability, the, the provisions, the, the wealth to be able to deny it. He says, deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And I'll be honest with you, that is exactly the condition of the present world. It is a condition specifically in Titus, and we'll look at this next time, of what's going on in Titus. You're going to deny, what are you going to do? Put off. 
that we should what? Live. Now we're going to put on. He's got a, he says, Calvary paid and dealt with all that. Put it away. Get rid of it. Get it out of your life. Deny it. Purge it. And now let's go live. Let's put on who you are in Christ. Let's put on the new man. Let's possess your vessel as who you are. Galatians 2, verse 20. Look over there. Galatians 2 and verse 20. There's a... <clears throat> Galatians 2, verse 20. You got Galatians 2, 20? Run back to 1 Corinthians 6 for just a minute. Because I, I want you to see something here. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9. You see, folks, the, process, the, the issue of possessing your vessel, that's what we're talking about, your walk. Notice what he says to the Corinthians. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Lost people won't inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, But be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And... Such were some of you. Now notice the war, it's all past tense. What were these guys? Lost people. That's who they were. They go to Calvary, they get, they get justified, they get saved, they get sanctified. Now watch the rest of verse 11. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Notice what happened. They had an identity change, didn't they? This is what you were, a bunch of lost people, living any way you wanted to live, doing whatever you wanted to do. You come to Calvary, the cross stops that mess, turns around and gives you a new identity. Galatians 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. These next three words are what I'm after. Yet not I. It's the need. It's not I. Folks, you can know every Bible verse. You can know every reference. You can run every idea. You can nail it all down. You can have all everything. But until you realize that you need this it won't it won't mean nothing to you but just words on a page when you see when you begin you know when you need it is when you see your failure when you realize that you can't trust yourself anymore so you've gotten down to the bottom you fell down the ladder to the bottom rung and you're looking up and you know what you go you go you know what <laughs> I need some help. I need to get back to where I belong. And that's not I, but Christ liveth in me. So when you come back to Titus 2.12, the first aspect of this verse, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, and it's teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. But it's interesting, he doesn't call it a present evil world. He just calls it the present world. It's evil. We know it is. But notice in verse 12, the first step here is it's teaching us that denying. It's a life controlled by the Spirit of God. Not regulated by the law, by the way. Because what does the law do? With the law comes the knowledge of sin. What does the law do to you? It just keeps reminding you you're, you're a sinner. You're guilty. <laughs> it does, that's all that it does to you. So we're not talking about something regulated by the law, but rather a life of conformity to the identity we have in Christ. Taking that identity and 
applying it, bringing it into the details of life. It's a life controlled by the authority of God's word, rightly divided. It's a life controlled by the authority of the, of the working and the ministry of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. It's a life controlled by the, the love and the grace of God and allowing the love and the grace of God to control you and to control your life as you walk by faith in an understanding of who God has made you. And that gives us victory. And he gives us victory in those details of life. So what begins to happen then in life is verse 12 becomes a reality. It's like, wow. Look at, ha have you ever noticed that? Have you ever been disappointed by someone? Never. No, I had a guy one time tell me we were talking about uh, entrepreneur and owning a business, and he said, never have employees. And I'm like, really? Why is that? He goes, well, because they disappoint you at every turn. I'm like, okay. So his, his little motto was no expectations, no disappointments. I'm like, oh, okay, that'll work. We didn't do it. I, <laughs> I, I disappointed him because <laughs> uh, I said no to his offer. But the thing of it is, is what happens when someone disappoints you? It hurts, doesn't it? hurts deep. But what do you then do with that? Makes you mad. They disappointed you. Paul says, be angry and sin not. What happens when that happens? You know, so whatever it is, you, you can have victory in that moment. And you can say, you know what? Christ died for that disappointment. And I'm going to take the moment to count to 10, because if I don't, then I know that other side of, the Hulk side of Rick comes out, and <laughs> the green machine hits, okay? So I'm going to count to 10, and I'm just going to, let it be. Learn from it. Move on. And then when you see the person, <laughs> clobber them. <laughs> no. When you see them, <coughs> hug them and say, hey, look, you disappointed me. But that's okay. We're good. And move on. And then in 10 years, bring it back up again. <laughs> you don't remember? Eh? No. Move on. You see, you just take who you are in Christ and apply it to the details of life. And what happens, have you ever been in the shower? Man, when I see that dirty, rotten rascal, I'm going to nail him. I'm going to say this to him, and I'm going to say that to him. And when he says this back, I'm going to hit him with this. And, boy, I'm just going to hit him with these verses. And, rah, 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 rah. and then you see him walk in the room, and you go to the other side of the room. <laughs> you know. You get all wound up, don't you? Take a time out. Say, hey, Christ hung at Calvary when I was his enemy. He died for me. That issue of forgiveness is a big area. Forgive. Does any man have a quarrel with an, another? <clears throat> Forbearing and forgiving. Even as Christ forgave you, so do you. You, do, you don't have a choice. You're to do it. <clears throat> what are you doing? You're just accessing the, the wealth and bringing it down into the details of life. Wonderful verse in Romans 12 Paul says, we rejoice with them who rejoice and we weep with them who, we, who weep. In order to do that, that means we're actively involved in each other's lives. And when that happens, friction happens. So sometimes you just got to say, let's put a little oil. Let's put a little olive oil in there, the Holy Spirit and the grace of God. And it'll lube the situation and be just fine. Again, it's a life controlled by the authority of, of the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God rightly divided. The grace of teaching us that denying. How do I deny it? First, I've got to know who I am in Christ. Process, step one. Step two, the key, the kicker, is to then know I need it. And I need it. 
And once I know that I need it, I can reach over there and bring it into. Then the denying, the stopping, the purging is not, an, is not a hard thing to do. Because I know who I am in Christ. I've accessed that wealth of the database. And now I just turn and apply it to the detail that's in front of me. Today's Father's Day. You think about being a dad. Right now in our country, men are under attack. It's not a good thing to be masculine. It's crazy. So what happens? You have young people who don't know what it is to be a dad. To be a husband. What did we just learn earlier in chapter 2? The older men have an issue. They have a teaching ground, don't they? But it's interesting. The attack seems to be in areas that are questionable, if you will. And all it would take would be someone to apply a little grace to the situation, and it would be okay. I was just reading about a news guy that got in trouble, something he said, just kind of off the cuff, not even thinking, and they fired him, let him go terminated him and I was reading the comments down in Twitter and they're like wait a minute what happened to the day when the woman could stand up for herself and knew how to shut the guy up (laughs) if what he said was accurate you know because you don't know it's on Twitter but you know everything is true that's on the internet you know Abraham Lincoln said that right okay so I'm reading that I'm like so I kept reading the comments and you know what was interesting? It was almost two to one. This is stupid. This is getting out of control. What, what happened to the day when you would teach the young people how to defend them and stand up to this and deal with, you know, and I was like, wow, you know. You and I sit with a wealth of information on how to do that. I'm not talking about let stuff slide and, and be wrong because you're stopping the wrong. I'm just talking about doing it in a spirit of, who you are in Christ. Things come up in life all the time. You just got to be able to say, you know what? That's not right. And we're going to stop doing that. Why? Because one, I know who I am in Christ. And two, I know I need Him. Because if it's left to me, the war is on. But I know I need Him so that there's some peace and harmony and a victory clause come into play you follow all that the rest of the verse we'll get into the ungodliness and worldly lust in the present world and then we'll talk in the third weekend we'll talk about the living and living it the first thing you got to catch though the process is you got to know who you are in christ and you got to know you need it and when that happens victory comes in because you're going to take it and you're going to say all right let's throw it at it (laughs) And apply it. And if you've ever thrown mud on the wall, some some stick, some don't. And the stuff you stick is what you remember, and the stuff you don't say, well, we'll use that for another time. And you put it back in the in the bucket. Okay? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word, for the instruction here on how to how grace teaches us and how we are designed to and have that access to, by faith, all the wealth, all that you have for us, and how we can take it, believing it, needing it, and bring it into our lives. And I just pray, Lord, for everyone that they would look at it, study it, get to know who they are in Christ, and then realize that they need it and bring it into their thinking. In your name we pray. Amen. All right.